Welcome to Design Speaks, the podcast that helps you use uncommon inspiration so you can overcome creative block and make better work. I'm your host, Brandy C. Joining me is my co-host, Julie Heider. Hi, Julie. Hey, Brandy. So are you so excited for our guest today? I am. I'm so, so excited. I know this is going to be an amazing conversation. We, we have the amazing Natalie Frank on with us today, and um, there's going to be a whole introduction that happens that tells you a little bit more about who she is when the interview starts. But um, just so you know, only part of this interview is available um, via this podcast. And if you want access to the full episode, that is actually available to all of our patrons over on Patreon. So um, it's it's a great, long, valuable episode, and um, I want you guys all to hear it. So hopefully you can uh, find it in your hearts to support us for even a dollar would be super helpful to keep this podcast going. But other than that, what have you been up to, Julie? Uh, I'm finally getting back into doing elopements over the summer, so I'm super excited about actually getting to like be physically working outside of the office, which is awesome. Yeah, so by the time this episode airs, I think it's probably October. Oh, wow. Okay. So, <laughs> so we're like thinking, we're like projecting ourselves into the future right now. Um, yeah, we, just for transparency, we record, we record early so that we can have the summer kind of to ourselves and have some free time. Um, but yeah, I I was struggling with with uh, figuring out how to bring my inspiration with with recording so far in advance because it, it seems very like to the time right now <laughs> as opposed to like what's going on in the fall because Brandy's always inspired by the fall and the cold yes. weather. and oh, I love the fall. All that stuff. So right now what's been the most inspiring to me is um, – Kenny and I have had to very much like switch up our our strategy on our vacation. <laughs> we had to cancel our trip to Disney World, which is a huge bummer. And because of COVID and all the extra work he's been needing to do as a video producer for his job, he can't take two weeks vacation now. He can only take yeah. one. So... Um, we were planning on going to Yosemite, and then I, they just announced that they're not they're not probably going to be taking um, campers until at least August, and so that that was out. So I guess what I'm getting at is, I'm I'm having to find travel inspiration, a diff a completely different way than I ever have, and trying to tap into this thing that I have in finding uncommon inspiration and trying to see beauty and interesting things in places that I might not have looked twice at because there's not a lot of options, even for even for camping and going to places that we really were like, okay, well, if we can't go to Disney, we'll go here. Um, so right now, our, our options are looking at staying with family and beaching it up um, or in California or going to San Antonio and... Um, staying at this little, this little resort just outside of town. And so my, my inspiration right now is coming from a lot of um, people I'm looking at online that are doing what I hope to do. And that's finding, um, finding fun things to do. And so um, I guess I'm trying to really own the opportunity to show my kids something different as opposed to just like, we're going to go um, find all of the monuments and all the popular destination type things. So even if we can't even get to the Alamo, because I don't know, it might not be open in San Antonio, yeah. like we can go, you know, visit the rivers nearby and try and try and do what I'm not really usually doing, which is what you do a lot. And that's going out into nature <laughs> and being like, it's nature as opposed to like, I want to see buildings and things like that where there's lots of people. And now my, 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 out, my outlook on all that has completely changed. So inspiring for me right now is people like you who are able to find something cool anywhere 
travel there's related. There's always something. There's, <laughs> there's always, always something. something. <laughs> yeah, and and trying to look at the not the not popular places, and not that we just go popular places, but those tend to be the places that have the most to do for families. And so, trying yeah. to be, I'm having to tap into creativity of a different kind to find something cool and and fun for everyone to do. So, yeah, um, that's cool though. By the time this airs, this whole vacation will have happened. So you've probably already seen me have it on Instagram. So we'll see <laughs> yeah. how it goes. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So let's hear from uh, from Natalie and check out a really fun conversation that we had with her. Okay. So I've known Natalie for a few years now um, in person, but I've been watching her and her business and how she's grown a global community um, for the last five years or so. And I'm just blown away by like, what an amazing person she is, how much she gives and how, um, how big she thinks uh, in terms of just making the world a better place. So I'm really excited that we get to talk to her today. And uh, I know the conversation is going to be really great. So, Shelly, thank you so much for having me and Brandy. I like I sorry, I didn't mean to jump. I just got excited. Okay. I had to You're like fine. jump in. I this is we we talked about this months ago about yeah. doing this episode. So the fact that it's here. Sorry, it's happening. Just, oh, it's the best. It it's came really best. fast. And so much has unfolded in that time. It's like we live on a different planet, you know? We really yes. do. <laughs> oh. So I I got involved with the Rising Tide Society because of Julie. And I would love for you to just give us a, what's your, what's your elevator pitch, Natalie? Oh man. Okay. So when it comes to Rising Tide, here's the elevator pitch. Um, Rising Tide is a community of creative entrepreneurs who gather in the spirit of community over competition. And our organization is all about education and empowerment. It's about giving people the tools they need, making uh, access to that education accessible and through community, through relationships, through looking out for people, lifting them up, encouraging and amplifying voices. We empower all of us to raise the tide together. So that is what Rising Tide is all about. And I, I love that you're a part of it. And obviously, Julie uh, has so much to do with the incredible community in New Mexico. And so it's just, it's so, so special to be able and to And you have a connection to New today. Mexico. I do. I, well, first of all, I always, Julie. <laughs> besides Julie, which is a great connection to have too. Um, my, my dad and my stepmom and my baby brother live out in, in, uh, Santa Fe, right outside of Santa Fe out in La Cienaguilla. And, um, oh, nice. I just, you know, love visiting, have visited for years and years and years. And it truly has such a special place in my heart. And I tell anyone when they say, okay, what's your favorite part of the United States? I say, New Mexico. And they go, wow, where? And I say, New Mexico. <laughs> I was like, like if you, you need a passport to get there. They always ask me that. They always do. They mm-hmm. always, you know, of course it's funny, especially the East coasters. They really don't know what's up out West. Um, <laughs> it's funny, but, but not funny. I know, but I stand by <laughs> it. I really stand by it. I think New Mexico is one of the most, um, extraordinary places potentially in the world. And I've traveled a lot, but there is something really incredible about the state, about everything, everything, truly, like every aspect of of society and culture as it relates to New Mexico. um, It's really an extraordinary place. That means a lot, actually. Um, I'm president of AIGA here in New Mexico, and we're in the process of um, not rebranding because we're part of AIGA, you know, but for our local chapter, um, kind of trying to figure out what our voice is uniquely. Mm -hmm. And we're literally in the process. um, I'm leading our team on figuring out what is good about, like what is special about us? Like what's different about us from AIGA Colorado or Arizona or Texas who are similar, but what, what's like our USP, right? Like what is our unique selling point? And so um, I have a hard time figuring that out because I was born and raised here and I'm just like, Take me to New York, please. <laughs> so I love hearing that from from someone on the outside. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, go ahead, Julie. I was just going to say, so speaking of um, the Rising Tide Society, one of um, – one of the most memorable meetings we ever had actually before I was a leader um, was pretty early on in uh, in the Rising Tide Society's history. But we talked about 
um, value and pricing. And it was just a really interesting conversation because I think it's a a hard thing to figure out. And every single one of us has struggled with it, Um, especially when you're kind of in the beginning stages of your business. It's really overwhelming to figure out what you should be charging and, um, you know, what your value is. Like, that's kind of like a process you have to go through to for you to believe in your value and then to be able to share that with others. Um, So that was kind of one of my favorite conversations that we've ever had was on that topic. So I think it's really great, Natalie, that you're here to talk to us about that today. And um, I know you're a big... um, you're a big cheerleader for everybody to know their value and to actually charge it. And so I'm really excited to hear what you have to say on the topic today. Amazing. Well, I'm excited to answer any questions that you have and dive in and provide as much value as I can to your listeners. Okay. So I don't know if, I don't know how, if Julie had like a starting question. Did you have a starting Uh, question? (laughs) I I feel like I have follow-up questions. Okay. Okay. So, um, Part of what you said about educating and empowering, um, that's what I also hope to do. That's that's why I've, I started a blog, then a YouTube channel, and then now this podcast is I don't want to just educate people. I also want to give like actionable tools. And in in the avenue of pricing, I know that I've definitely not talked about that enough. And I also feel like it's something that's almost like a weird guarded secret. It's like, you know, they always tell you when you work in an office, like, don't don't tell other people what you make. And so even when you go outside of an office setting and you become a creative entrepreneur, I feel like that's just like, shh, it's, don't talk about it. And then we're all just like, <laughs> what the heck do I charge? Like, yeah. I don't know. And then you see Fiverr and I'm, this is more on the like this side of like branding and things like that. And then you're like, okay, well, if they're charging like $100 for whatever you need and any number of revisions, I guess maybe... I should charge $50 so that I get the jobs. And so you, you know, Rising Tide isn't just designers. It's not just photographers. It's like creative professionals. What's, what do you think is like a good way to start that conversation with other creatives so that you cannot just be like, what do you make? (laughs) Yeah, I'm about to make some waves. Are we ready yes, for some yes. waves to be made Definitely right now? Ready. Do it. That's what we're I'll about I'll warn here. you. I'll warn you. I get passionate and I get fired up and I just unleash. And so you're about to experience I the can't unleashing. Wait. <laughs> um, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the truth. Bottom line, price secrecy is the number one reason, I believe, that there isn't fair wages paid across the board, especially to women in the workplace. Period. When we aren't transparent about what we charge, we create the ability um, for just a lack of a lack of knowledge, transparency, and therefore ultimately uh, money to be made in both in the corporate workplace and uh, in the creative one. You know, we've done a lot of research at HoneyBook and Rising Tide, specifically as it pertains to gender pay gap, specifically as it pertains to the fact that, um, you know, women in the creative space are making less than their male counterparts and oftentimes actually have more experience and more education when looked at comparatively across the board. Especially in leadership positions. Especially in leadership positions. And so, sorry if I'm making some waves, but the truth here that I really believe um, when we look at it is not, whenever, by the way, I should preface this, whenever we talk about gender pay gap, people tend to get a little uncomfortable because they have an initial perception that somehow I'm saying, you know, men aren't enabling women to make what they're worth. And that's not actually what I'm saying, because when I did the research and we looked at hundreds of thousands of invoices, you have to remember that these are prices that women are setting themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are rates that women are choosing to charge. And herein lies the reason why price transparency is critical. When we aren't communicating, you know, hey, I'm charging this much and I'm actually going to be raising my prices, then no one's aware of just how high we can climb. No one's aware of just how much our work is worth. And therefore what starts to happen, and you you allude to Fiverr, Fiverr is an example of this, is we do the opposite. Instead of raising Mm -hmm. the tide, instead of raising our prices and holding steadfast to the quality and, and the money we can charge for that quality of work, we start to race to the bottom. Yes. You know, things like Fiverr, a lack of transparency in pricing, a lack of confidence in pricing, um, you know, a discount, discount, discount mm-hmm. mentality, all it does is drive the entire creative industry right. down. 
Okay. So whether we're talking from, you know, a gender perspective, we're talking about gender pay gap, or we're just straight up talking creative, regardless of mm-hmm. which gender of all the genders that you identify as, the reality here is that if we aren't transparent in pricing, if we aren't coming alongside one another and saying, hey, look, when I started, this is how I priced. Here is what I learned. Here's maybe what I would have done differently. But I want to show you where I am today, five years in, 10 years in, and how I got here, then we're never going to enable the entire industry as a whole to raise the tide together. So I have a lot of thoughts on that. That The price transparency is a a big one. I remember when I was a full-time wedding photographer and there was this terrifying feeling of, I don't want someone to know how much I charge, so I would never put it on my website. And th- the thought was, how do I guard my, you know, secret sauce so right. that no competitor <laughs> steals it rather than saying, how do I serve potential customers through my pricing in a way that actually generates more revenue? The concentration and the focus leads to the output and the action. So when we concentrate on our competitors, when we concentrate on that place of fear of, I can't let anybody know what I charge. Mm -hmm. I can't let anybody know how I work. I can't let anybody know my secret sauce. We lose sight of the fact that we're not building this business to run from competitors. We're building this business to run towards clients that need us. And so in the realm of pricing, you know, the same theory applies in my my mindset. I believe in also creating transparency transparency with clients in a strategic way. This doesn't mean you have to publish all of your rates. That's not what I'm advocating for. I think there's a ton of strategy around just publishing certain amounts of information that, you know, leveraging things like anchor pricing theory. So that's the idea that that first number you put out is the number that that client will anchor to psychologically, right? They will anchor to that number. And therefore, any other numbers that you throw their way after that first impression number that they've anchored to will either be perceived as more expensive or less expensive. And so I leverage this, for example, as a photographer. A lot of people would say, oh, starting at $3,000. And I'd say, why would I tell them I'm starting at $3,000? Because then anything else I throw their way is going to feel really expensive. It's going to feel really pricey. And my (laughs) pre-qualification... It's so true, right? My pre-qualification is setting them up for a, you know, discount mentality. Like Mm -hmm. how much can I get for that, for that amount versus what I changed and encouraged people to do is putting out a number that says most people spend between most Mm. investments are around and giving your median, actually giving sort of your, your center numbers. And so instead of saying, Hey, my collection started at 3000, I would say, for example, like, Hey, most couples, I was a wedding photographer. Most couples spend between $4,200 and $5,600 on their wedding collection. Now, did I have packages that were higher than that? Absolutely. And some people love to spend money and they love to feel (laughs) like they're getting the Rolls Royce of wedding photography (laughs) and I'm all for it. Okay. I love the upsell. I love the strategy that comes into play afterwards. But what I didn't have happen were people would never email me and then ghost because they couldn't afford me. And the amount of hours that saved me and you know, the, the ability for me to then enter into client conversations already with that prerequisite that they had a transparent understanding, mm-hmm. right? An earnest understanding that the relationship was built on honesty. It was built on trust. It was, hey, here's what most people spend. If you're in this range, let's have a real conversation versus I can only afford the smallest number she threw out and everything else, I, I, I feel uncomfortable. I don't want my clients to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Now, I also believe, I'll say one more thing, and then I want the follow-up questions. <laughs> I, I want y'all, I get fired up. No, I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> okay. The other thing here too is I also believe in not being afraid to refer business out if it's not uh, financially the right fit. So if yes. I would have a client come to me and say, hey, I can only afford the lowest package or this is what I wanted, this is what I envisioned, and I can't afford that with you. I really believe that that is an opportunity to serve them well by referring them to someone else in my community who does incredible work, who is more in their budget, who can provide them with the experience I believe they deserve at the rate they can afford versus shaming customers for not being able to afford, which mm. I've unfortunately seen in the industry, trying to you know get every ounce of money out of somebody like, or, or you know sell them on something lower. I, don't, I just have never truly believed in that as a business owner. I've always believed in this philosophy of, okay, when they leave my hands, like when a, when a potential client or an existing client, a customer leaves my, my services, leaves my communication, like leaves my hands. How do they feel about the experience? Do they feel supported? 
Do they feel loved? Do they feel served well? Or do they feel like I tried to get something out of them, that this Mm -hmm. was a transactional opportunity? Because the reality here is relationships should always come first. Profit will follow when you have strong relationships, right? So yes, I'll leave it there. But all to say, when it comes to pricing, anything in this realm, um, I'm game for a hundred percent. You'll get, you'll get my honest all, opinion. All the on. answers. Yes. Yeah. I, I can't wait. So go far. ahead, Julie. I'll let you go first. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, especially the last part you mentioned about referring out, like you have to get to a place, um, a mind shift, which I think is very much a part of, um, the rising tide society of not the scarcity, but like yes. there's more than enough to go around. And if this person is not, if this isn't my people, it's Okay they're somebody else's people and it's better for everyone for me for the other uh creative and also for the client that they be referred out and I think um like when you get to that point you feel just really great about the whole situation because it's a Mm win-win-win um and everybody is going to end up happy versus if you do try to be like oh well you know maybe I could um give them a discount I really need to book this you know like I my numbers aren't where I want them to be that kind of thing then you start to feel just icky Icky. about it yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah, like and it just um I think from the client's perspective they might start to feel like weird or guilty about the fact that you're making changes for them Mm -hmm. um and you at the end of the project may feel like man was it really worth it for me to do it for that price and that just kind of creates a tension there that is not the best experience for anyone. So Mm -hmm. I think it just is a mindset shift of like, um, it's okay that this isn't going to work out. Something better will come along and I'm going to send these guys to somebody else who, um, it is the right relationship. And what I'm hearing here, you know, you mentioned abundance and you mentioned scarcity, and these are terms that have been around for a long time in business. What I also am hearing is a sense of self-confidence. And this is something that we see oftentimes. And and again, when I look at, you know, the data around pricing and the data around, you know, who charges more and who doesn't, there's also this big concern in my heart around confidence. And are we empowering people with the confidence they need to charge what they're worth and to walk into a room with their head held high saying, I've spent three years honing this craft. I deserve to charge what I charge or even on their first day in business to say, I'm going to work harder than anybody else for these clients. I deserve to charge what I'm going to charge. I'm going to serve them well. Confidence is critical in order to adopt these mindsets of abundance, in order to move forward with sort of a a mindset that encompasses what what you're talking about, right? Not coming into a relationship already Mm -hmm. insecure. And actually we did, um, I will never forget, there was the a night where we we did in San Francisco, it was, it was one of our theories. I think it might've been sales. It might not have been pricing, but with one of our topics for Rising Tide. And um, we talked about how different people sell differently. And there were two examples. The first example was somebody who walks into a room and says, hey, you know, um, yeah, it's $5,000 for my services. And I would love the opportunity to work with you. And here's kind of the vision for what we could do together. And the other person kind of walked in and said, you know, um, I, I kind of, I normally, I normally charge like $5,000, but you know, maybe we could do a discount or if that's not enough, like from the start entered the room with that fear that they were already going to walk out and go to somebody else with that fear that the number they threw out there wasn't a number that was worth throwing out there. And so I do believe there is so much that is interpreted and perceived on the side of a client not even just verbally, right? Even with the way we hold our bodies in meetings, even virtual ones, friends, um, (laughs) with the way that we choose to describe ourselves and our businesses on our about page, with the strategy that goes even into our design, which Brandy talked about, like our, our brand, how we convey ourselves out in the external world communicates to a potential client our confidence in the service or the product that we deliver. And it is so important to truly believe and, and to communicate that belief that you are worthy of the price that you charge and you are worthy of the clients that are interested in your work. 
I know it's scary. And I know that there are all of those, you know, kind of whispers, I call them lies that, that whisper in our minds that tell us, you know, you're not enough or you can't mm-hmm. possibly charge that. Or who do you think you are to try to quit your full time job? You got yes. it. You got it. Imposter syndrome. And so we have to consciously attack that. You know, the, there, there's an understanding that most of our thoughts are actually sub and un, in, sort of like in that subconscious, we'll mm-hmm. call it zone, right? So they happen and operate in our mind very much unconsciously or subconsciously consciously, depending on how you define it, and we're not even consciously or cognitively aware that, that they're happening. And I do believe that imposter syndrome a lot of times lives in that like subconscious to just peeking its head into the conscious realm. So what we have to do, and I'm not trying to get wooey on anybody, but what we have <laughs> to do is we have to attack those thoughts the minute that we do become consciously aware of them. We have to rewrite the script. It is so important. We have to rewrite it in our minds. And actually, if, if not even verbally, at least, at least, you know, silently, mentally Mm -hmm. affirm ourselves in those beliefs. Because look, I used to think that mindset shifts and mentalities were not concretely based in results. I used to think that, you know, I wanted to see the data. I wanted to see the proof. Um, and, And the longer I've been in business, I've been an entrepreneur for over 10 years now. The more often I can look back on my life and see how there is a deep connection between moments where I feel strong in, in my own you know, well-being and who I am. I feel resilient because I know I am capable of overcoming. You know, I am proud of the work that I'm creating and how that translates to the decisions that I make on a day-by-day basis and how those decisions that I make on a day-by-day basis roll up mm-hmm. to trends and those trends roll up to yearly profit and loss statements and those roll up into whether or not I'm still in business five years from now. And I really believe there is power when we are able to build that confidence within ourselves. And if we're struggling with that, to join communities, like mm-hmm. Rising Tide is a great example, where people can pour into us, where people can yeah. affirm us and where we can say, hey, can I be vulnerable for a second? I've got to be vulnerable. This is hard, right? Yeah. And we can come to the table honestly and say, look, this is what I'm feeling. I, I want to go in this direction, but I just don't know. Like, is my work at that place? Can I charge that? Or, you know, th- those rooms where you can say, here's what I've been charging and I don't think I'm charging enough, but I've been too afraid to raise my prices. Mm-hmm. And to have a room full of your peers give you honest and open feedback about where you're at, whether it's a, a pricing strategy or a creative strategy or marketing or business mm-hmm. stra- uh, plan and strategy, all of that plays into that, that realm of confidence and that idea of self and how you walk through the spaces that you occupy. And I really believe that there is so much to be said for surrounding yourself with people that are inspiring, encouraging, Definitely. and yeah. empowering, right? Yeah, for sure. I think that like that is absolutely the heart of it is confidence, I think. And that's something that I've struggled with for a very long time. Um, and I think two big shifts in that um, – for myself were one realizing it's not just about my work. Like, um, I think I always thought like, Oh, am I as good as like these top, you know, photographers and everything. And it's, it's really hard to compare yourself because everyone is different. And I'm sure Brandy knows like every designer has a different, um, perspective and a different just voice of how they produce their art and so like how can you compare that you know um and the truth is it's so much more than just the work that you're producing it's the experience that you're giving to people it's your um expertise it's all the other stuff too and once I kind of shifted my mind off of like is my work good enough to be charging five thousand dollars to being like okay, here's this incredible experience that I'm giving to people, including this art that, you know, is good quality. Um, That helped me to see, like, I think the pressure was all on my work. Like, are these photos worth $5,000 or whatever? Um, And once I, I took the pressure off of that, it was easier to see like, oh my gosh, yeah, I do need to raise my prices. Um, And then the other thing that I did was just to keep track of how much time I was pouring into each project. Um, I have this little spreadsheet that I've been keeping for years and um, it's, you know, how long am I spending on culling and editing and emailing and location scouting and all this stuff. Like, so now that I know how many hours I put into that, and then you Mm -hmm. add on the fact that you know, there's just experience involved as well. Um, and then also the final product, the photos, like that's a huge amount of stuff. And just seeing like, I'm spending like 
20 to 40 hours of pre uh, wedding day work on people's um, elopement days. That's like, that's crazy. That's a lot of time that I'm, um, you know, saving them from having to do. And that's a huge, huge value beyond just the photos. And so like knowing that, like knowing my actual numbers of this is the average amount of time that I'm spending on this project, um, it felt more like I had the freedom to be like, yeah, this is how much I charge. And if I were to charge any less, like, oh my gosh, I would be way underpaid for how much work is going into this. And also just like my own experience and expertise of knowing things that couples wouldn't know and all of that. So I think, um, I know Natalie, you're like a big numbers person. And I think that really helped me too, just to know, like, here, here's how much work is really, truly going into it. And I'm always shocked by how many creatives are making less than minimum wage because yes, oh my there gosh. <laughs> is a focus in our world on we like we concentrate so much on vanity metrics that mm-hmm. don't matter. Yeah. And we fail to actually do what you just did, Julie, which is saying, hey, I took time to really look at the metrics in my business that do matter. How much time is being spent per how much I'm getting paid on a project and even being able to just take that data and apply it strategically to decisions you make a year from now. For example, there might be aspects of your business that have incredible profit margins and others that don't. And you might even be able to start to shift some of your internal business strategy around, you know, enabling your creative work to work better for your bottom line. And so, you know, for some people, this looks like, you know, doing upselling of products after the experience. This is something, for example, as a photographer, I discovered like in, in my wedding experience, for example, a lot of people tend to, let me even just say this too. I'll add one more thing before I dive in. The way things have always been done doesn't have to be the way that you do them. It also isn't (laughs) always the most strategic way to go forward. Mm -hmm. What worked a year for a year ago in your industry may not still apply uh, right now, even, I mean, amidst a pandemic, it literally may not apply. So Mm -hmm. the strategies that we're working may not work today. And part of being a modern business owner means constantly adjusting and innovating on our strategies. I want to preface with that. When I was a a full-time wedding photographer, there was just an understood belief that you had to include albums in your packages. And I, I started to do a little bit of research and I found that most of my couples came to me with a budget for their wedding. Now, they didn't really know what they wanted in that budget, but they knew how much they wanted to spend. And the same probably applies even to branding, right? If you're doing design mm-hmm. or any sort of creative pursuit, people come in with an idea in their head of like, okay, here's my budget of what I can afford. And then you as a service provider are the expert communicating to them within that price, what are the, what are the items that are included, whether they're services or products. And just by doing math, and talking to clients and getting feedback from them, I realized that many of them, many of my couples already came in with a number and they really wanted a great experience on their wedding day. The products after the fact, they could buy six months later, a year later. And that product didn't have to connect to the budget they walked through the door in, which essentially means that if I include the album from the outset, like had been done throughout the entire history of wedding photography, <laughs> yeah, I was automatically taking, you know, three to $400 right there out of my, um, you know, essentially my profit margin at the end of that experience where the couple would have been just as happy to add that on a la carte mm. six months. 12 months later, when their their own bank accounts had resettled after the wedding, they got in some gift money and they wanted to spend that money on things that would, you know, carry on as part of their legacy. And one of those would be a wedding album. And so I shifted my entire strategy. I did service only packages. They were extraordinary. I did 10 hours on the wedding. I mean, I changed everything and I ended up increasing increasing my my bottom line as a result. And people would purchase, you know, those products six to 12 months after, and I built campaigns around it and I marketed it separately. And it became an additional revenue stream for my business um, that changed everything about how I operated all by looking at data, all by talking in qualitative and quantitative, right? Getting, getting those inputs um, and those insights from clients. And so, so much of that, you know, it's, it's one of the things that at HoneyBook, I'm really passionate about too, is like, how do we equip people to really understand how to make those prices work for them, how to look at their data dashboard and their reporting and analytics and understand everything from, you know, where our customer is coming from so that you can double down on those strategies. Like if you think, for example, where we spend our time, so many creatives spend so much time on Instagram. And yet when they go and they look at where business is coming from, they might even see referrals far above social media on that list. I see this all the time, referrals from other people in the industry. 
And sometimes I'll say, well, why don't you double down and invest time in networking? Why aren't you showing up to your local RTS group? Why aren't you taking out that other creative for coffee? You know, doing nowadays, maybe not coffee, maybe we do a Zoom virtual pandemic. <laughs> Take them out for Zoom coffee. <laughs> meet up, you know, it's, it's a little different, but it still works. But this idea of if that's where your your money is coming from, if that's the the individuals that are booking you or are, you know, hiring you for your services and they're coming through that channel and they can, you know, afford the prices that you're setting. They, they are excited to work with you. They're, they're fitting that ideal mold and however you frame that out, um, double down on that, right? Double down on that. So I don't want to get too far off topic, but I think one of the key insights here that I would hope anyone listening would take away is, if, even if you're not a numbers person, even if you're listening to this and you're like, I am creative Not going to keep a spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, well, actually, that's even better. Not going to keep a spreadsheet. Sign up for HoneyBook and you'll have it reported for you beautifully <laughs> and visually and you'll love it and you'll be able to digest it. My key takeaway here is find a way that you get access to this data and maybe just once a year, you take time and you sit and you think strategically about how to leverage that information in order to create a more profitable business and provide a better service to the people yeah. that you're you're serving. Because um, one more thing I'll just add to this in terms of pricing that, you know, Julie, you kind of touched on, and I want to take a highlighter and just highlight it, is, you know, when you do raise your prices, the bottom line is you're then able to provide a different level of experience that you weren't able to provide at a lower rate. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've seen this across the board. And I've seen, you know, the types of experiences that are provided when, a business is set up such that there's client gifting involved, right? Or there are strategic surprise and delight moments is how I talk about it in community, yeah. but surprise and delight moments where a client wasn't expecting something and it was already built in to the expected costs for that experience, but they didn't know it. And so for them, it feels extra mile. For them, it feels like you went above and beyond. It's the the, the ribbon tied around the under promise and over deliver slogan that so many of us believe in and cling to. And it's this, this concept that ultimately enables businesses when they do charge more to provide an even more extraordinary experience. And ultimately, I like to look at it as a momentum wheel. And when you have one raving customer who loves your product, it starts to spin that momentum wheel. The better you serve and the, the ability to charge more enables you to serve better and better and better yes. and be more intentional. And, you know, to use a Seth Godin phrase, purple cow about how you, you know, <laughs> market through that service, it, it spins that momentum wheel faster and faster and faster. And ultimately what ends up happening, and this is something I experienced in my own business, very much so, is that the emphasis and the stress and the pressure to go out and book every single person who comes through the door releases because suddenly you have more inquiries than you have time to manage. That's where you want to be in business. Mm -hmm. You want to be in a place where you can give freely. When I talk about referrals, that comes from that mindset of abundance, but you can also build that abundance by serving people well and creating that referral mechanism. And I, I actually teach, it's in a community building space, but I teach a lot on this idea of, you know, nurturing somebody from follower to brand evangelist. And the idea that that should be the goal, it's not even about converting to customer. Once you get a customer, you're only halfway done, friends. You are mm -hmm. halfway through the battle. You need a fan, right? Then you got to turn, yeah. And people <laughs> call them everything. I've heard Pat Flynn calls it super fans. Yeah. I, you know, everyone has a different phrase for what they call it. I really like to think of it as a, a brand evangelist. It's someone that goes running around screaming, you have to hire Brandy. You have to hire Julie. You have to hire Natalie. This person changed my life. They did X, Y, Z. It was extraordinary. And everything that they say affirms the price that you charged from the very beginning. And so it all connects. So I'm going to, I'm going to just go back a bit back to what we were talking about. Um, when you started talking about females in the industry and things like that and transparency. Um, when I graduated from college, I had the opportunity, um, Pretty soon after, I, I got in an entry-level position at an in-house. I was working for the largest church at the time here in New Mexico as just like a web person. And then an art director position opened up. And, um, you know, straight out of college, like, there's where am I going to look for, like, how much I should be making? So I basically took whatever they were giving me and got some raises over the course of, like, three years. I grew the team to, like, six people. And Julie was a part of that team at one point. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's how we met. But um, when I left to start my own stuff, 
I found out what I was doing research because I, I wasn't sure if I actually wanted to go full time into my own thing or, you know, how you're kind of in that in between place. So I'm researching what like art and creative directors make. And I was completely floored at how far less like that's probably not even proper English. I was so far under the bar for like just a median creative and art director in the country. Yeah. And I was just like, they knew it. I'm sure they knew it. They offered me something. I took it. They gave me a couple of raises here and there to like make me feel better about it. But then it was just like, okay, but even then that was like, just because these people were hiring, they say, you know, this is what you'll come in at. But I don't know what people are actually making. And so it was, it was really a shock to me. And um, then I ran into the idea of value-based pricing. Um, I don't mm -hmm. know if you know Sean Wes. Um, he's, he's a really huge influence on a lot of the stuff that I do. But um, I, was, I decided to start my own business and was trying to price my things. And he, he's very much about like, don't lead the conversations by talking about what's your budget. It's not because then it then the whole thing is always about money, right? Yeah. Um, and then also like what Julie was alluding to, understanding that you are charging for more than just a logo or something. And from that point on, that was like in 2011. If someone says, "How much would you charge me to do a logo?" I say, "I don't do logos. I do brand strategy, and a logo is part of that." And then that changes the conversation from the get go on top of having like a client onboarding that asks questions that measures whether you guys will even be a fit. Right. It's, it's, I've, I've always had a hard time even with like photography because I, I sort of have dabbled in that just as a hobby, but it's a whole other thing to try and price what you do on a value level. Mm -hmm. And you have to really look at, um, you know, not just being a technician, like I know yeah. how to use this software, Absolutely. but also I, I have, I have insight into color psychology and, mm -hmm. you know, finding your brand evangelist and all these other things. And so what's, what's your, what's your thoughts on like people doing something that's not quite as tangible as handing over some photos to, you know, because that is very, it is very like, you're here on my wedding day for 12 hours. Right. Oh, I see that. Okay, you're here. I see your face in front of me. You're taking pictures and then you hand it over and I give you money. Right. As opposed to like, I need a whole brand strategy and a lot of it is you're paying me to think, right? Mm -hmm. You're paying me to help you work out problems. You're not just giving me like a physical thing, especially now not even people need business cards as much and all the print things. So what, what's your advice to like, I know my advice and people have heard my advice, but what, what are your thoughts on, you know, creative professionals, designers, people that don't necessarily deliver a physical, tangible thing all the time? Oh, it's such a, it, this is a really great question. And before we even dive into the question, you said two things I want to highlight too. I, I have like a verbal highlighter. I apologize. It's my verbal no, highlighter. No, I love it. What I color it. is it? Um, oh, of course. Of course. It's the classic yellow highlighter. <laughs> okay, it's like okay. old school, you know, where it's, it's, I literally think it was called highlight, you know, H-I-L-I-T-E. Right. It's one of those. <laughs> highlight. I was going to say, I think, I think that's what it's called. It's like children of the nineties. No, rejoice I know. As, exactly. As I we, have a picture in my head. Exactly what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. We're eating our Dunkaroos. I'm, I'm 38. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Okay. So two things I want to highlight. Um, one of them here, you know, you mentioned uh, this idea of leading value, you know, and, and having value be sort of what you lead with. In, in my world, in my realm, I've always referred to it as relation, relationality over transactionality. This idea that you need to approach a client as a relationship and not a transaction from the start. And so oh, I think- I love that, yeah. That mindset shifts everything. That mindset then transforms how you even set up your brochure or your pricing PDF, for example, because instead of leading with, here are my rates and here's my deliverable, it is, here's who I am, here's what I love, here's how I think, here's what I can do, here's, here's you know, sort of my proposal to you, oh, by the way, here's what it costs. Mm -hmm. And the importance of that is, yet again, you're leading uh, with that value and you're leading with that relationship and you're positioning it from a very different vantage point than creating something to be so technical and transactional mm -hmm. as a logo, $500. Right. Now, 
there are people that are always going to maintain that transactional approach to business. Um, I, I do believe, though, they attract very different clients. Yes, and yes. some people who want that. You got it. Then the type <laughs> of clients that the three of us, this trio is referring to. So if you're someone that kind of is like, look, I just want to design the logo and I want to be done. I don't mm-hmm. want to do the rest of it. Then maybe the advice we're giving right here might not even be the best fit for you. I like to kind of preface that one. That's like a side little you know, note beside the highlight. But if you're someone that says, look, I want to work less, make more, um, work with clients that just light me on fire creatively, mm-hmm. appreciate what I have to offer. Um, this is the route that I took to get to that place. And I'm seeing some nods here. So I think um, that's kind of what we're affirming. So that's the first highlight, relational over transactional. One other thing that Brandy just like slid in there with like client <laughs> pre-qualification. She's like sliding into the DMs, you know, like <laughs> some like, you know, just random. But that is so critical. So I believe in intentional resistance. This is what I call it, intentional resistance in the pricing uh, sort of strategy with a client. So once once a client says, hey, I'm interested, I love a little bit of intentional resistance to gauge their interest. And everyone does this a little bit differently. I used to have a friend that on their contact form had a, sl- had a scale from one to five. This was the Marantz's back in the day, Justin and Mary Marantz. I think it was either a sliding scale or it was like out of one to five, how interested are you in working with Justin and Mary? Um, And I remember her talking about this and I thought, genius, because if they're not going to put five, then they might as well not inquire. And at which point it's clear that they only want to work with people who are fired up and passionate about wanting to work with them. And that changes the game. That changes the psychology of the relationship. Mm -hmm. It almost creates uh, what we like to think of as like an opposing interview process. So it's not, hey, I'm interviewing Brandy about her design expertise. It's like Brandy's interviewing me to find out if I'm the right fit to be a client with her. Changes the dynamic and therefore changes the entire experience for both parties. So that intentional resistance could be a questionnaire. It could be a little, you know, gauge of information. It could be, you know, wanting to set up uh, an in-person conversation consult before proceeding, even to talk about pricing. However you as a business owner determine you want to do that, I just want to highlight it. Intentional resistance, I think it's really strategic. Now let's jump into what Brandy asked, which is around, you know, what if you're selling something that maybe is difficult to even define in terms of a physical product? I'm not going to have a book arrive at my doorstep. There's not going to be a t-shirt that gets shipped to me. I'm offering, you know, sort of either either I'm a knowledge broker and I'm Mm -hmm. offering my knowledge and I'm almost consulting or um, the the product, quote unquote, is you know sort of intertwined inextricably with the information that I can provide you with my expertise, my insight, my strategy, mm-hmm. um, so on and so forth. Look, I think I think there are, are key tenets that I've seen be really successful in these types of working relationships. Because you have to remember, although I am a business owner, I also work with designers. I worked with several designers. I believe that the designers I work with are some of the reasons why I've been so successful. I worked with brand and marketing strategists that have done everything from help me to launch. We just um, on the personal side, I just launched a long live small business. Uh, t-shirt collection. We donated that. Yes, 100% awesome. of the profit to Freelancers Union to raise money for um, business owners impacted by COVID. That's That was launched preemptively as part of a bigger strategy for 2020 that someone had for me when I said, hey, I'm writing a book. I need to grow my email list. And I don't really want to sell anything because right now I love the work that I do day in and day out. I've got a nine to five job, Honey Book Rising Tide. It's my life. I don't, I don't want to go out and start selling things to, to build my list. I'm not going to create a course right now. I'm not going to do any of those things, but I got a book coming out. So I sat down and I talked with a marketing strategist and the marketing strategist said to me, well, what, what is it that people love? What is your why? And she started going through this whole thought process that I never would have gone down around. What are you passionate about? And what resonates with people? And I started mm-hmm. talking about these values that I'm like, I think people follow me because, you know, they can connect with what I really care about and they can tell that I'm genuine and they can tell that if push comes to shove, I will fight for them. That is who I am. And, and then she said, okay, what do you fight for? We talked about community. I talked about belonging. I talked about small business. And so we started to build a strategy. So without ruining the surprise of what's coming in August. You know, basically I sat with someone who used their knowledge, their expertise of working with other brands and businesses to build an entire strategy around helping me to hit long-term career goals when my book publishes in 2021 in a way 
that aligns with my values and aligns with my ability to serve people well and to create a personal branding experience that aligns with the community one I've built over the last five years and feels right because it is right. I never would have been able to come up with that if I didn't have that knowledge experience, mm-hmm. you know, kind of value exchange with, with someone else who's done this. I probably would have followed a method that wasn't going to work or would have rubbed people the wrong way because I was selling it not from a place of authentic passion, but because I thought I had to in order to reach a career goal, which is never how I've ever achieved anything of success in my career. (laughs) And so I say that to say that when I first sat down with this person, you know, to be honest, I wasn't really sure what I was getting out of it. I I didn't really know at the end of the day whether this was going to be successful or not. That's the risk that we often undertake in any kind of business relationship. Mm -hmm. But- I connected with her values. I could see testimonials of people that she'd worked with. I valued their reviews and the fact that they said, yeah, don't even ask questions, just do it. Um, (laughs) You know, and that, and for me, I was like, okay, I will. And along the way, you know, there are key tenets that I noticed, you know, very clear communication, um, the ability to anticipate my weak spots and kind of like she'll jump in and, you know, she, she has her strategies for how she communicates and how she delivers um, deliverables that aren't, you know, physical products or even mm-hmm. really digital ones. Um, but just through this, this relationship, and that's really what it becomes. It becomes a business relationship. And I, I think it is less about, um, you know, she didn't price me out and say like, Hey, I'm going to help you reach this metric and it's going to cost this much. She said, Hey, you know, here's my monthly retainer to work with me. I know it's steep, but at any time, you know, after we had a set contracted period, if it's not working, I want to encourage you to, you know, go find somebody else. But I think, I think we're going to hit it out of the park. And my goal is that you'll look back and say, I would have paid you twice as much. And that I was like, done, you know, like I (laughs) love that, that mindset. And I'll be honest, I would pay her twice as much. She's probably listening and I'm probably going to get an invoice. Um, (laughs) It's true. I think this is free advertising. I know. I know. Right. I mean, oh, well, yeah, hold on. I mean, I, I, I'm all about sharing referrals, but I'm, I might keep her to me. Um, I got okay, a lot of projects okay. coming up. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. But, um, I think, I think there, there are some takeaways there and I, I hope, I hope that's a value. I hope, I hope you can pull some, some good nuggets from that. That was a really amazing conversation. And, um, you know, one of the things that I was going to ask Natalie was, you know, once you have, um, a price that you feel, confident in like how do you share that with your potential clients in a way that really communicates that value um but I didn't ask it because I felt like the whole second half of the conversation was answering that question yeah it sort of did but I also I actually wrote down that same question and didn't end up asking it um my question was and maybe we can just chat about this for just a couple minutes my question was um you know, it's all about relationships, right? And and mm-hmm. being able to cultivate relationships with people before, you know, you you have the ask. It's the Gary V um, jab 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 right hook, like give give yeah. give and then ask. But um, when it comes to pricing, and I've been I've been dealing with this lately. It's like I've been getting a lot more inquiries or people responding. Like they've like people have never responded to me this way before, like they are now. And then I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, so they're asking me about stuff but it's not, can I hire you? So is this the place to go, well, I can help you with that and here's how, or do I keep pushing the relationship a little more and pushing the, or like, when, when is it like, like right hook time? When is it yeah. like, here's the <laughs> ask. I know you need this. You said you need this. You said you appreciate this. Here's how I can help you. And it's, I don't know, $250 for a session or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is really hard, especially, um, I mean, I I just have a hard time asking for money and asking for the sale because I am not like a super forward person. Um, and so I, I do feel like that that's a hard thing to kind of figure out the balance. But mm-hmm. I think you can also just come back and be like, um, you know, if you can answer, if you can see their need and answer their questions before they're asking them um, and, you know, you're already showing what you can do for them and in those conversations that you've already had, I think it's okay to be like, Hey, like I would love to help you with this. And here's some of the really awesome stuff that we can accomplish and do through this. And then if they're still not ready, you can keep having that conversation of helping them. Um, and then hopefully it will lead to them actually, you know, officially working with you. Yeah. 
So um, I hope all of you enjoyed the conversation. I hope that you got a lot of value out of our conversation <laughs> on value. And I know I did. And I was taking notes for myself. And I was like, I need to re-listen to this episode not yes. just for uh, quality control, but like <laughs> like a listener would listen to this episode because she just yeah. had. I love when I love when people get on fire about what they're talking about. Whatever, yes. like no, it, I don't care what it is. Like as soon as you you just know the things that get people fired up, and yeah. I know I have those things, and I know you have those things. And it's like you just flip that switch, and it's just like okay, wind them up and watch them go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I and she was totally like that. Yeah, I definitely am going to um, take some of the things that we talked about, things that I think kind of have been in the back of my head but need, like, full attention mm -hmm. to say, like, this is this needs to be part of my marketing strategy and how I'm putting myself forward and actually, like, making decisions based on those things that I do believe. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it was such a great conversation. I think it would be really helpful no matter where you are. If you're starting out, obviously, that's incredibly helpful. Um, but it doesn't matter how far into your business you are. That stuff, like, you need that that push towards all the right things. Yeah. The, the thing that I wrote down that I was like, oh, I hadn't thought about it like that is, like, how you're pricing now. But like, how has your pricing developed since you first started? Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking like, well, because my pricing has always been expensive for this market. I haven't changed it much since I started my business like nine years ago. It's yeah, shifted wow. very little. And I'm just like, okay, I think... I think I need to make some time to revisit. Yeah, time to take a look <laughs> at that. So anyway, she was super helpful. And I hope you guys will uh, check her out. All of the links to everything that she talked about will be on on slash in our show notes. 